I'm truly amazed that there were not more technical difficulties with what I just did. <laughs> Therefore, says Paul, since we have been justified by faith. It's a simple little phrase. Short, sweet, great way to start off this reading from Paul's letter to the Romans. But what we find out is, this simple little phrase is actually a little more complicated than it first appears. Now the first thing that jumps out to me with this simple little phrase is faith. We talked about faith uh, last week a little bit. We talked about faith as it is understood in the book of Acts. We talked about faith as Paul talks about it in his letter to the Romans. If you recall, we talked about how faith is a active trust. Faith in Acts, faith in the letter to the Romans is not just some uh, cognitive function. It's not just some um, mental belief. It is active. It is trust. It is a way of being. It is almost like a lifestyle. Active faith for Paul says that faith is a way of being, is a way of living, and the one who epitomizes this faith is none other than Jesus the Christ, the Son of God. Because Jesus, as Paul sees it, Jesus lived a life of active trust. Jesus lived a life trusting in the promises of God, trusting in the word of God, trusting in the righteousness and the rightness of God. Ain't this ringing a bell? Okay, that's good. All right. Jesus is the epitome of faith as Paul understands faith because Jesus endured suffering, torture, an execution on a cross while still believing that God would raise him from the dead. He endured all these things while believing in the impossible, believing that God was going to do what God said God was going to do, and that is what faith is all about for Paul. Faith is that belief, that active trust of what God says is going to happen, is going to happen. Uh, is anyone a fan of Indiana Jones? A few of you? Okay. Uh, so in the third movie, Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, Indiana Jones is looking for the Holy Grail. Yes? And, you know, if you haven't seen it, he finds it. Just letting you know. Spoiler. Sorry. Should have given you a warning on that. Uh, well, in the process of finding the Holy Grail, he finally finds the location, the underground cave, sort of, of where the Holy Grail, the cup of Christ, exists. And he finds out that there are three tests, three obstacles that he has to go through to get there. And the third one is, actually there's four, but the third obstacle is a leap of faith. And he finds himself on a rock ledge on the edge of a cliff in this underground cavern. And beneath him is an abyss. There's no bottom. And he has to get to the other side, to the other opening in this tunnel. And he can't leap there. He can't step there. He can't lunge and get there. There's nothing hanging down for him to lasso his whip around so he can swing across like in all the other movies. He has to figure out a way to get across. And it is a leap of faith. And so Indy takes his hands, holds his diary over his heart, closes his eyes, puts out his foot, and falls forward. And when he falls, he lands on a solid rock bridge that had been hidden to his sight before. That is active trust. That is the faith that Paul is talking about. That is the way of being as he understands faith. And it is that faith that is epitomized in Jesus Christ that justifies us. That's the next part of that simple phrase, right? Therefore, since we have been justified by faith. And even though I love TV shows and movies, I just want to make sure that you all know I'm not talking about the Justified series on FX with Marshall Raylan Givens, Elmore Leonard story. Again, y'all really got to have a better, wider range of things in your life. I'll make a list of all these things you need to watch and read before each sermon from now on. Anyway, we're not talking about that. Don't worry about it. We could obviously talk about it, 
but we're not talking about that. Uh, to be justified, as Paul talks about. What does it mean to be justified, to be just? Well, Donald McKim, in his Westminster Theological Handbook, of uh, Dictionary of Theological Terms, says that to be justified, our justification, is the process of God making a sinful person just. The process of making a sinful person just, whereby they experience or attain God's peace or salvation. In other words, justification is God making all of us sinful people just, so that all of us sinful people can enjoy God's peace, so that all of us sinful people can enjoy salvation. That is justification. It is what God does. Now, one of the things that you remember we've talked about, uh, about the book of Acts a couple weeks ago, and that Paul continues here, not only this understanding of faith, but that Paul continues this idea of intentional cross-cultural ministry. Do you all remember this? Paul does a good job of reaching out to beyond traditional uh, boundaries, beyond traditional stereotypes, beyond traditional cliques, beyond traditional cultures, and brings everyone together. And the way that he he does this, the common ground that he finds for all these diverse people is that all of them are sinful. All of them are trapped in sin. Now sin, when Paul talks about sin here, we're not talking about the individual wrongdoings. We're not about talking about the one thing you did this morning that you shouldn't have done. When Paul is talking about sin and about all people being trapped and enslaved to sin, it is a cosmic sense of sin. It is this idea that sin is a reality that infects all of us, and there is nothing any of us can do to escape the reality of sin. And it is that which brings us all together. We are all sinners, and there is nothing we can do by ourselves to escape that reality. That's why for Paul, it is important to say that we have been justified. God has made us just. We cannot escape that reality of sin, but God who makes us just through the righteousness of Jesus Christ, that is how we become justified. That is how we experience God's peace. That is how we attain salvation. It is nothing that we do. It is what God does in making us just through the righteousness of Jesus Christ. That's what Paul means when he says that we have been justified by faith. By the faith of Jesus Christ, God has made us all just. God has granted us, given us, bestowed upon us salvation. Now, if we wanted to, we can stop right there. God grants us salvation. That's good news, right? We can end the sermon right now if y'all want to, and we can get to Luby's ahead of all the Baptists and the Methodists. And you know, it's Mother's Day, so it's going to be a long... I'm getting there. Hold on. It's all part of my shtick. Just give me a minute. (sighs) As Penny and Donnie are reminding me, now my Robert L. Keene joke has gone flat. But you don't have to worry about that. We have Second Sunday, so y'all can stick around for more sermon. You see that? See how that goes? Okay. So we have more to say. Yeah, so we could stop right here and we could just be happy. We could say, hey, great, God justifies us. We've achieved salvation. That's it, end of story, game over. But if the whole purpose of our religion, if the whole point of our relationship with God is just to attain our salvation, then we have a pretty selfish religion. In fact, uh, in her book, Diana Butler Bass, her book, Christianity for the Rest of Us, talks about how one of the main criticisms that non-Christians have of Christians is that we are pretty selfish, that we're a bunch of navel gazers, that we are people who are more focused on our salvation, our personal relationship with Christ, our personal experience in the church, more so than all of the other things that religion is supposed to be about. And I think she has a point. From the outside looking in, we often appear to be pretty selfish 
self-centered people, worried about our own salvation. Now, in her book, the biggest uh, criticism of this kind of comes in the form of evangelical megachurches, you know, where you get your latte in the lobby and your soul saved in the sanctuary. But this criticism of the church has been around long before the modern-day megachurch. Long before the modern-day megachurch, people have seen that sometimes Christians are kind of inwardly focused. In 1937, in his book, The Cost of Discipleship, Dietrich Bonhoeffer talks about cheap grace. To paraphrase, cheap grace says that once we find out we are saved, we're done. Once we find out we are saved, we bask in the glory of our salvation. We enjoy the moment, and that is it. Bonhoeffer describes cheap grace by saying, cheap grace is baptism without church discipline. It is communion without confession. It is taking advantage of the grace that God gives all of us. And so if we just stop at justification saying that we have been saved, God has made us just, and so we have been saved, if we stop right there, we all become part of that idea of cheap grace, and we all become guilty of being those self-centered Christian navel gazers that so many non-Christians think we already are. But justification doesn't stop at salvation. That is not where our story ends. You see, you can't talk about justification without talking about sanctification. These two things go hand in hand. Justification is what God does to us and for us. Sanctification is what we do for each other, one another, and the world. Sanctification is how we live out God's justification. Sanctification, according to Don McKim, is the process of growth in faith powered by the Holy Spirit, often showing itself in the life of the believer by good works. See, justification is what God does, and that inspires us to do more. God makes us just, and we are so grateful. We are so grateful for what God has done that we go and do more. We do that which God needs us to do. We are grateful for what God has done, and so we go and we do all that God needs us to do for one another and in the world. A friend of mine described this once as a grace-filled responsibility. As Paul continues to talk about us being justified by faith, as we live out what that means to be justified as we practice our sanctification for the world, we find out that Paul's understanding of faith starts to grow and merge and change as well. Not only does Paul believe that Jesus Christ is the epitome of the faith, but we also find out that Paul believes that all of us should participate in that faith. And the way we participate in that faith is that we believe that we are justified. We trust in God's promise that we have been justified. We trust that God has saved us so we no longer have to worry about that anymore. And we live as though we have been saved. We believe in God's word that God has made us just. We believe that God has granted us peace. We believe that God has saved us and so we are free to go out and do for the world, all the things God needs us to do. God has made us just. We should go out and sanctify the world. Amen?